Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our midweek Bible study. This evening, we're going to be jumping back into Hebrews chapter 10, just to have a look at what God's Word has to say to us, how it teaches us and instructs us. Uh, but as we do that before, or before we do that, let us just pause for a moment, come into God's presence, and just quiet and still our hearts as we talk to him. So let us pray together. Father, we do just pause now. We want to set aside the busyness of the day and come into your presence and acknowledge you as God, as Lord, as the one who is all wise, the one who is perfect, the one who knows us better than we know ourselves. Father, you are the one who has poured out love and blessings upon us every day. And even though we rebel against you at times, Lord, even though we fight against you and go our own way and do our own things, you still love us and care for us. Father, your love is amazing, unlimited and transforming. Just as we come to your word tonight, Father, just remind us of that love. That love which wraps its arms around us. That love that holds us close. That love which brought Jesus to be our saviour. And Lord, just help us to really want to know you more. To want to grow, grow closer to you day by day. To want to know better how we can live our lives for you to better understand your word. That is our desire, Father. And we ask that tonight, through the leading of your Holy Spirit, that you would do that, that you would open our hearts and minds to you. So Lord, thank you. Thank you for this time together that we can have now. Thank you for your word. And continue with us now, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. So folks, let's just start to read from verse 11, um, just through to uh, verse 22 at this stage. Let's hear what God's word says. So this is Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 11. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Then he sat down at the place of honour at God's right hand. There he waits until his enemies are humbled and made a footstool under his feet. For by the one offering he, he forever made perfect those who were being made holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says... This is the new covenant which I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he says, I will never again remember the deeds, the sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. So, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new Life giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty conscience have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Amen. We'll pause there at the stage. As we've said before, the writer of Hebrews reminds the listener, the person, or the group of people who the letter is going to, all about the temple and the sacrifices, and then points out to us that um, sacrifices themselves could not forgive us our sins, and it had to be the one perfect sacrifice through Christ. And again, a lot, or some of what I said here in Hebrews chapter 10, reflects back to the Old Testament, to actually to Jeremiah chapter 31. Um, just let me read that put it to you actually. It says in Jeremiah 31 verse 31 starting there, the day is coming says the Lord, 
and that's God, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by their hand and brought them out of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. They will not need to teach their neighbours, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. You can see the quotation um, in Hebrews here from Jeremiah. You can see the point that the, the author, the writer is trying to make, that Jesus coming as a sacrifice was the new promise, the new relationship that God had spoken about. And that again actually reflects in the revelation. You know, quite often at a service of thanksgiving or at a graveside, we'll read Revelation 21, talking about a new heaven and a new earth and about how God will dwell with his people. He will be their God and they will be his people. That talks about the new relationship the new heaven, the new earth, the new way of living, all because of what Jesus has done. Because Jesus is the perfect one to die once for all times. And that's why it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 18, and when sins have been forgiven, there will be no need to offer any more sacrifices. You know, Jesus is that one sacrifice. But what does that mean to us? So here's one of the things that the, the author is trying to get, the writer is trying to get across. In the days gone by, in the days of the temple, there was a nervousness, a real nervousness of the people, and even a nervousness of the priests. That if they would go to the temple, if they would go in there and they weren't worthy enough, that they could be struck down. For the priest, as even for the high priest, as he went in to the, the, the most holy of holy places once a year to offer that sacrifice, which we've talked about, to uh, for, for sins that are unknown or unforgiven. If there was the fear that if he hadn't offered the right sacrifices before that time, that he would be struck down dead because he was not worthy to be, to be in there. And that's why they tied a rope around him so that whenever he went in, they could pull him out if anything happened. And it talks about going through that curtain. Now that's the same curtain which uh, in the, 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 the story about Jesus and the crucifixion, as we, as we read through that, we read about the, the curtain in the temple being torn in two from top to bottom. God signifying that the barrier has been removed. So here in Hebrews 10, it talks about by his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. So to go through into that most holy holy place, the, the priest had to sacrifice before he could. But God is saying now that we have life giving way through that curtain. It's completely turned on its head. Because Christ has already died, there's no need for any more death. And more importantly, there's no need for our death spiritually. We can actually now have spiritual life because of what Jesus has done. And we have a new means by which we can go into the place where God is, where we can go in through that curtain, who is Jesus. And it says, and since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty conscience have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. In other words, let's not worry. I'm not worthy. We already know we're not worthy. We already know we're not good enough. But now we know that that price has been paid by Christ. And if we've accepted God as our Lord, if we've accepted what Jesus has done for us, we don't have to worry about that unworthiness. Now, that doesn't mean to say we don't worry about sin and that we don't do all that we can not to sin. Of course we do all we can not to sin. 
But we don't have to worry that that sin is going to keep us away from God. More than that, not, than that, we have confidence that we can enter into that place where God is, which ultimately is heaven. You know, all of this, when it talks about that inner part of the temple, it's reflecting forward to what that stands for. It stands for heaven. It stands for God's home. Again, that place where Jesus said, I am going to get your home ready. And when it's ready, I will come and take you to be where I am. We know that we have, you might want to put it as, a, say, a personal invite. We have our place reserved. There's a seat with our name on it, so to speak. Um, our spot is in heaven because of what Jesus has done, if we have accepted him. And it's all about us accepting what Christ has done for us. Because by accepting that, then we are recognising that we can't do that, that we are not good enough. And that it's not about us, but it's all about God. And it's all about what he does for us. You see somebody trying to do something. Uh, and we have that phrase, if at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again. It's like somebody trying to do, um, say, a high jump. And they say, I know I can do it. I just need to keep on pra trying and practising. And, and yet, yeah, maybe in the end, they will get good enough. They will train enough. They will become strong enough. But that only lasts for a short time. And then that ability will go again or that strength will go again and they'll no longer be able to do it. Like a weightlifter at the height of their career. How much weight can they lift? How much can they bench press or, or deadlift? You know, as they get older, they lose that strength, that ability. And they can no longer do it. Salvation is not like that. We know we can't create, cause, bring about our own salvation. It's only through Christ. And whenever we realise that and surrender that off to God, that should actually give us relief. That should give us ease of worry. That should make us say, oh, thank goodness. Thank goodness it's not dependent upon me. It's not dependent on my actions. Thank goodness, because it's just not going to happen otherwise. And we just give it over to God. Uh, and he is in control. Or he is in the driving seat. And because of that, then we have confidence. We have reassurance. We have hope. And that's what the author wants us to realise. That it's all about God. And then if we can get that, if we realise that, if we've surrendered to him... But that should change everything else that we do. That should change our outlook on, on every other action that, that we do. Um, Realising then that it's all about God. Yeah, and again, that's why in, in, in church we, we talk about how our actions reflect God's love. You know, if, if we can get that right in our heads and in our thoughts and in our daily routine, then we're going to show that to others. We're going to actually let others realise that. And then God's love and the power of what Jesus has done can transform their lives. Amazing. You know, it, it's the ripple effect, isn't it? You drop a, a, a stone or a pebble into a pond and then you watch the ripples go out. You know, even if you, if you take it from the shore side and you throw it and you see it splashing down, Look at how far the ripples from that splash spread. How that one action has a lasting effect. And it does. It, 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 if you were able to track the momentum, you would see it tracks all the way to the shore's edge and actually will touch the shore's edge. And even though you cannot see that, maybe with a naked eye, or maybe because you've gone on, you've missed it, your action, that, that action still has an effect. The same with our actions. You know, that, that's particularly important at the minute at this time. Our land is talking about our actions and how our actions are affecting the health service, 
how our actions are affecting those who are around us and how we can have a positive effect. You know, that's one of the reasons why the, the main church leaders took the decision to, to voluntarily close the church buildings. Let's set the example. Let us have a witness that shows that we care about others. Think of the person who is struggling, um, the person who can't get out to do the shopping and how somebody says, let me do that for you. That shows that person that they're cared for, doesn't it? And if somebody asks, why do you do that? Imagine being able to give the answer, well, I love you because God loves me. So I want you to know that love as well. And how that love can change so much. Wow. Let's go back into Hebrews here. Hebrews chapter 23. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. So, yeah, there are different times in our life that we will worry and that we will we will wobble to talk about or we have our doubts. The author says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope. Now, it's not hope. As I've often said that, you know, I hope this will happen or hope that will happen. But it's hope, it's trust, it's true faith. It's something that you can bank on. So let us hold firmly to the hope that we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. It means God's not going to go back on his word. He's told us this is what's going to happen so we can bank it. We can trust that we are saved through faith in Christ. I said, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good work. Encourage one another, in other words. Don't criticise one another, but encourage one another. You know, we see enough criticism in this world, don't we? We see constant criticism. You have to say at this time, who would be a politician? Who would be um, an MLA sitting in Stormont? Because no matter what you do, you're not going to get it right. And yes, I mean, our politicians have admitted at times, yeah, we've got things wrong, but let us learn from that. And we're all the same in every action in life. We learn from it. But rather than putting each other down and criticising each other, the Bible says, let us encourage one another. Think of ways to motivate one another. Think of ways to spur each other on. Open our eyes. And see who around us is struggling. See who around us is having difficulties. See who is coming under attack as such, as we would say, from dark powers, from evil. See how we can just help them. You know, if, if we don't help one another, we fail in so much, don't we? Because we are a family in Christ. We are brothers and sisters. And as brothers and sisters, we should be looking out for one another. Yeah, like all families, brothers and sisters fall out at times and we do fall out. We do disagree. But we need to show the love which Jesus had. Love which put the needs of any, everybody else before his own needs. Love which is true love, true agape love. Therefore, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. None of us know when God is coming back, when Jesus is coming back. It tells us in the Bible that we should live each day as if it is the day that he's coming back. It tells us that we don't know the time because it's like a thief in the night. So make the most of all the time that you have. It says that we should not neglect meeting together as some people do. And some people have used that verse at this time to criticise and to point fingers and say, no, you, 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 you shouldn't be just doing distance. You should be meeting together. Folks, That that's not what it's saying. You know, whenever this was written, they didn't have other means to actually meet together, which we do. Think of somebody who's in a town who hasn't got any other Christians around them. Think how they must feel when they literally cannot meet with anybody else who is like-minded. But through the technology that we now have, through this that we're using tonight, we can now meet together. 
We can now encourage one another. And that's what this is about. I do truly hope and pray that you are encouraged by God's word. That you're encouraged by being able to do this together. I hope and trust and pray that you are challenged by God's word. But that you're also encouraged. And that it will spur you on to keep doing this. That it will spur you on to, to let others know what, we do, what we're doing. And find others to, to, to watch and to join in with our Sunday services as well. Because going forwards, we don't know when we will physically meet together. We know there are some folks who will continue to be nervous about this and will find it difficult to keep on meeting together, find it challenging within themselves. And so, yeah, this, this maybe is how they'll want to do it. So, you know what? Let's use this which God has given to us to be able to meet together, to worship together, to learn together and grow together. Not just within our own congregation, but right the way around the world. We're not limited by the barriers of how far can we drive on a Sunday? How far can we walk? We're not limited by that. We're simply limited by how willing are we to get involved? So how willing are we to meet together? How willing are we to encourage one another? How willing are we to let our actions speak of how much God loves us and cares for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word, for its encouragement and for its challenge. Lord, help us to accept the challenges that it brings to us, to, to, to grasp with them with both hands, to, to let others know how much you care for them and to use every opportunity we have through whatever means we can to spread your word. Father, thank you and continue with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for joining in tonight. And I do trust and pray that you know God's peace and God's blessing. And we'll be back again next Wednesday night, same time, to do this again and to go into the rest of Hebrews chapter 10. See if we can get through it or not. Who knows? We'll just wait and see how we get on. Uh, and we'll keep on learning together. But in the meantime, take care. God bless. Bye.